Welcome to the one within all to another episode of Interverse Podcast. And you may already know and love the guest we're about to talk to tonight. However, before I dive into the introductions, I'd like to just get a few announcements out of the way. Now that I've been doing the podcast pretty much always live, it doesn't leave the same room in the outro for me to like promote other stuff that's going on. So I want to make sure everybody is full and well aware that there's a brand new audio book out narrated by yours truly. The fourth of the Spirit World series by Dylan Sicoccio called A God's Acre for Winds of the Soul. You can find that linked in the description of this episode, wherever it is you're finding it. And I hope you you do check it out. I put in a lot of work. I mean, had to learn how to read Greek. (laughs) I'm like, I, I know Hebrew letters now. There's all kinds of benefit and value to you getting the audiobook, even if you have already read the text. You might even want to go over the text again with the audio playing so you can hear how things are pronounced. It's really going to help you upgrade your keys to symbolic literacy and see the bigger picture of how all of these different mythologies and spiritual systems are interconnected, really, and demonstrate that there's something for sure being hidden about our history in terms of where all this came from. And we're a lot more alike than we are separate, that's for sure, regardless of where we find ourselves in the world or what path we've chosen to follow, all lead to the center, right? (laughs) So there's that. And then, you know, there's always tunings. Get on my schedule for February before it fills up. I would love to do some biofield tuning with you guys. The results have been continually mind-blowing and awesome. And all those announcements aside, we're going to be talking to Emily Riddout tonight. You can see with me here, she's been on the show more times than I can recall, (laughs) but we're going to maybe backtrack a little bit into some of her history because her initial appearances would have been quite a long time ago. It's awesome that Emily and I both started what we're doing currently at around the same time, I think 2016, 2015, somewhere in that ballpark. So as she's launching her very first book at Astro Yoga for an Aquarian Age, I couldn't be happier to have her as one of the most recurring all-time guests to come on here and tell us all about it. And astro yoga as a topic we'll be covering more deeply than we have in quite a while. It's definitely a perennial subject that there's no lack of uh, opportunity to continue fleshing out more aspects of how this as above so below connection that we have to the entire cosmos, man being the image of the universe. It never ends. There's always more to learn. It's uh, even for Emily, I'm sure. So really excited to have you back on. Thank you for being here again with us tonight, Emily. And how are you doing? I'm doing so well. Thank you for having me back on. And I'm thrilled. I didn't know you were learning Hebrew. I'm thrilled that you're studying that. Maybe we can talk about that sometime. For me, studying Hebrew and Sanskrit have been some of the most rewarding (laughs) things in life. Oh, yeah. There's Sanskrit in that new book, too. (laughs) <laughs> in the uh the the Dylan Sarko show book all the all the scripts that's awesome i'll i'll have to check it out oh please do but you know this is about you <laughs> <laughs> we're here to celebrate your new book launch and talk about it in depth i was very happy to be able to go over it before we talked today and check out some of the different subjects and chapters and you have a great whoever helped you edit it or you just did a great job in intrinsically but a lot of First timer books are definitely not up to the level of polish and uh, perfection that you've achieved. So I'm very, very happy to, uh, very happy to congratulate you on that. Good job. What's it like writing a book? I'd like to know. Well, it was like sitting down one day, deciding to write it, doing very, doing that very quickly, thinking I was done, and then having <laughs> the publisher and everybody else be like. Mm, actually, there's about 30 more steps. <laughs> so um, I was like, oh, this will be out by September. I started writing it in June. Um, it actually just came out. And in fact, you have read it before probably almost anyone because I don't even have my physical copy yet. <laughs> but I'm looking forward Perks to Perks of it. being a podcast host. Get early access books if you ask nicely. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So go go ahead. Joy. I think writing is so fun. I minored in creative writing in college and it was just such a a pleasure. Yeah. That was my major. I feel you. (laughs) It's a, it's really a helpful skill to understand how to workshop your own stuff and you know, the quality 
quality assurance <laughs> that comes in with that bit of education. Uh, so, you know, okay, I want to just kick it over to you and give you a lot of room to talk about the origin story a bit more, because I'm sure we've discussed it before, but like I said, a lot of people here are probably not hip to the older episodes we've done together. So, you know, you, you briefly touch on it in your time in your book, but your time in India, how this set you, uh, you know, you go there for yoga and you wind up finding out about astrology and you set out to disprove astrology. How did that go? What changed your mind? And, and tell us more about your journey abroad when you were younger. Yeah. So 13 or 14 years ago, I went to India and I actually went there on a study abroad program. And then later I went back. I don't know if you know this about me, but my first job after college was teaching music at a music conservatory um, led by the man who did the music for Slumdog Millionaire and 127 Hours and a couple of other movies like that. So I went um, and I wound up doing a yoga teacher training at the local college and I was studying meditation and all these things as you do while you're there. And they, um, you know, it was very matter of fact. I felt um, some of the circles I was running in, they would be like, oh, you're you're an American, you know, that you're, not, you know, you're a Christian nation, you know, Jesus is lost 30 years, we're here. And then they'd be like, and of course, the astrology of this. And I was sitting there like, this is all new information for me. I've been practicing yoga for a while, studying yoga for a while, you know, taking courses. Um, and of course, studying deeply um, religion and sort of that purview, which is why I'm interested in astrotheology. But um, I was shocked by some of the um, intense suggestions made by astrology. Okay, things like looking at your chart and knowing not just when a woman's first period started when they were a teenager, but knowing the exact month Right. Things like this where you're like, wow, that's a lot of specific medical information you're getting from my chart there. Or And so I started trying to disprove it because I thought it couldn't couldn't be real. And of course, anybody who tries to disprove traditional systems of these wisdom traditions, they're always wrong. It's always the wisdom tradition that turns out on top. If you ever decide to go fight against the cosmos or the divine, you'll know who's likely to win. It's not going to be you. And so now through a twist of irony, I studied it for 13 or 14 years and, you know, went back to graduate school, eventually studied it um, in various areas, did extra yoga teacher trainings and the whole nine yards. And here we are talking about it today. <laughs> um, I mean, at the point where you can predict exactly when a young girl's cycle first kicks off, I mean, you're pretty much, that's no longer pseudoscience, <laughs> you know, like we're in the realm of like knowing stuff. So that's pretty I cool. remember there was a guy in my, tra there were three Americans taking this like largely um, just people from India, yoga teacher training. And there was a guy in it with me and he was really fit. And I remember he would go to the 6 a.m. one, six days a week that we all had to go to. Then he would go to the 4.30 p.m. class. And then at night on the roof, when I was up there, like relaxing, he would be up there doing jump squats. And I remember reading his chart and being like, this says you have weak ankles. <laughs> and thinking that it had to be wrong and him informing me that that was in fact where he got the majority of his injuries from all of these systems. And yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty shocking. And I can tell you from doing medical astrology readings for various medical practitioners or doing um, astro yoga sessions for people who want to come and look at their chakras or their physical alignment, or just how to use their body to get what they want in life, that it's, it's surprisingly accurate. Or maybe others aren't surprised, but I was, in fact, surprised our our crowd probably isn't any more surprised but uh i want to back up to that little point i've heard this said from hindus before that jesus spent his for uh lost 30 years 
in India. I think that they're a little off by that. It's however many years was between when Krishna was introduced and Jesus became the thing in Rome. I'm pretty sure those are the, all the lost years, so maybe quite a few. There are so many similarities between the myths of both of them that you know it pretty much proves them to be versions of the same character. The one that sticks into my mind lately is how uh, Krishna was raised in Mathura or Mathura, which is the exact name of the place where the Catholics say Jesus was taken in Egypt to be hidden from King Herod. Uh, and Krishna was being concealed from an uncle that wanted to kill them, kill him who was a king or something like, you know, that's just one little point in the whole web and constellation of similarities between them. But they're both shepherds as well. Totally. And both born of virgins, both with the baby version and the adult version. Um, yeah, lots of lots of things with Krishna and Jesus. Um, you know, it with things like Jesus's last years, it depends on who you ask, right? Some people will say that. Some people will say Babylonia. Um, there's some people will say, well, isn't this an allegory, right? So there's there's a lot. There's a lot to dig into, but the deeper you dig into any one train of thought, the more threads I think there are to pull out and get really good information. Yeah, my favorite stuff is the syncretism of it all. But uh, let's, you know, to get into some more things from the book, you just mentioned being a music teacher, which I don't think you said that in the book. Uh, yeah. But music and astrology, they really go hand in hand. And at one point in the introduction, you're talking about the resonant patterns of astrology and how that's like music or how you had an epiphany along those lines. Could you help us see that? And maybe it's a way that we can conceptualize the different layers that are interplaying for our experience here in, in time. Right. So it's not even an epiphany, right? If you study the quadrivium, you have number in time, number in space, um, this like kind of harmonic numeric system. And I actually, you can do astrology readings based on music. That gets kind of deep. I usually just do that for people who study sound healing and things like that. But you can break down the harmonic relationship between planets within the zodiac in terms of their harmonic resonance, right? And you do that mathematically, it's, it's pretty neat. Um, but it's true. So, so when you sing a note, and I might have even put this part in the book, but when you sing a note well, right, you have overtones naturally occurring. And there are some cultural forms of singing which teach you to pop out the overtones, which I was lucky enough to study um, as a young as a young person. Um, early in life. But if you sing a note, you're going to have, and forgive my wishy-washy math, but you'll have the octave overtone, I think the fifth above the octave, the eighth above the octave, maybe the second, third, fifth, and sixth above that. And, and they keep going, pre presumably to overtones that we cannot even hear because the notes are so high-pitched. And so when you're dealing with an understanding of, of astrology, one conceptual and accurate framework for that is that there's a resonance system and that the planetary movements are one visible depiction, somewhat visible if you're including outer planets that you can't actually see, but somewhat visible depiction of the harmonic resonance of the universe. And because the universe is this harmonic fractal, we are also experiencing those inside our forms. You know, this is the same principle of, of understanding the universe as a mirror with no originating image, right? Is this idea of the fractal and the harmonic resonance so that what you do down here on earth um, in a small way is affecting not just your life, but all of humanity and actually all of the harmonic resonance system. Does that? <laughs> I mean, it sounds like it, whenever you put it into just the, the words like that, it's like we're describing something kind of ineffable, kind of like those overtones that are outside of our capacity to hear. Maybe the outer planets are just like the, 
frequency range that's beyond hearing above and below the, you know, infra and uh, ultra, if you will. But yeah, yeah, I totally, I mean, I've, I've had, I've had personal subjective experience that seems to show exactly that the, the world is, <laughs> it's like chicken or an egg. Who, where does it start? Where does it end? But that the world is definitely a, a mirror to, you know, the inner consciousness of all of us, but, you know, especially your own self, the one that is, you know, driving the ship, if you will. Totally. <laughs> you ever wonder if the chicken and the egg question is actually a reference to the idea of the egg of space that contains all of manifest reality? Uh, definitely. <laughs> I say that a lot. Yeah, definitely. I yeah. mean, even um, makes me think of like, the Orphic egg being bitten by the serpent, but sometimes characters like Abraxas, they're like chicken headed, but they have snakes for legs. So maybe they're <laughs> no, the, the rooster or the chicken specifically the rooster and the snake have definite symbolic similarity to the idea of the sun. I mean, do we need to explain why a rooster a rooster in the sun <laughs> uh, what all, what's a rooster called what also rises with the sun you know all of that but that also the sun was thought to be like a serpent in its course across the sky throughout the zodiac and that those two things uh put them together into the idea of the cracking of the egg and the beginning or the birth of manifest creation that would be like the solar consciousness aspect of that luminary initiating itself into existence, if you will, like before the snake bites the egg or the rooster crows, it's a type of night where there's not conscious awareness of being right. Something along those lines. Totally. And the snake of course is also a reference to Scorpio. And I don't know if you've ever seen some of the, um, occult versions of the tarot where in the temperance card, right, with the angel pouring some liquid, he's pouring fire onto an eagle, the symbol of Scorpio, right, and water onto a lion, the symbol of Leo, and this understanding of those two signs being indicative of the sun, but in different solar aspects. I think about that a lot, the snake and of course, the eagle is not too far off from a rooster in terms of its talons. Yeah, <laughs> I like this answer. What came first, the chicken or the egg? God. <laughs> That's the answer, the answer to that question. <laughs> There's that. Yeah, so, you know, we've talked about astrology a little bit, but maybe to get into introducing the yoga half of this book, it, the how, how did the many layers of yoga or yoga is plural, if that's how you would say it. How do they change your consciousness to allow for greater freedom? And, you know, we can interweave that into specific astro yoga ideas as we go. Well, actually, I'm glad you asked that because what we just talked about, the harmonic resonance of the universe, is the same idea which perpetuates yoga. So we have two schools of thought and they're both actually convergent in a certain way one school of thought is that reality manifest reality yoga is made of light and the other school of thought is that yoga manifest reality is made of sound right so that separates the mantra yogis from sort of other schools of thought and of course we know maybe the mantra yogis are just kind of lazy I'm a mantra yogi, so I'm just kidding. <laughs> so I can attest that we are <laughs> a little. No, um, most mantra yogis I don't find to be lazy, but but they're they are very potent, right? Schools of thought, and of course they converge in the fact that they're both waves, right? I mean, light is particle and wave and perhaps sound is at one level. But if you look at it at one level, if you slow light down enough, it becomes sound. And the idea is like the originating whisper of the universe comes down into manifest reality through something known as the tapas system. And so we're down here, you know, eating and pooping and 
walking around being however we are. And, and we're trying in a certain sense when we do yoga to go on this sort of path of return to a state where we're no longer beholden to what appears to be solid manifest reality, but where we are entering into a state of higher consciousness that's always been existent within us, but that we're now integrating into our lives so that now instead of being the victim of life, right? The person who shows up and you say, oh, poor me, you know, this happened, that happened. But you can show up and say, okay, interesting. This happened, that happened. But now I'm going to yoke my lower self with my higher self and begin to take steps toward creating the life I really want. And we start that by learning how to move through the layers of existence in yoga. So something known as the koshas, right? The layers of your own individuated consciousness. And then, and of course, most people start with the physical yoga practice, but you can use any aspect of the yoga practice, particularly the physical practice, the mantra practice, um, different um, approaches you might use. I think I have some mudra practice in my book too, to move the energy, the energetics of your physical form and your energetic form. And you can choose, right? Mantra yogis are like, I'm going to start with the energy body. Asana yogis are starting with the physical body. Um, both are moving toward the same idea, which is that when you do these practices, all of what you want will come to you. And as things come to you, it will be revealed to you what you've been wanting, and then you can adjust your desires so that your desires become more desirous. Is that <laughs> that last part is the key? <laughs> the, I'm a firm believer that everybody gets exactly what they wish for, but whenever you're living life like you don't get what you wish for, you don't bother thinking about what it is you actually wish for. You have this this attitude of. You know, the attitude of the victim is that life is happening to them. And the attitude of the author or one that takes responsibility or authority is that they're happening to life. So, and then back to the idea of sound and light, I think that they are really the same thing on a different spectrum, you know, a different part of the, the spectrum that you can't really have one without the other. So I don't see, I don't know, as somebody that does energy work, I would probably prefer people started with the physical foundation of their body, but that's, you know, I think maybe I just don't have as good of an understanding of how the energetics can affect the, the physical. And there is a section in your book about this. Um, <clears throat> so I'm kind of jumping around. I have a lot of notes and stuff. So we're going to jump forward a little bit to a later section of the book, but, you know, talking about how to work with the luminaries in astro yoga, specifically the luminaries, meaning the sun and moon, not referring to the other planets and about how the influence, I want to talk about how one works with the luminaries and astro yoga, but also if we could expand on, I know I'm throwing two things at you, but the physical, chemical, energetic, and external shifts that the influence of the sun and moon can have on us. Because if I'm not mistaken, working with the solar and lunar energies, in a yoga practice intentionally could have shifts of uh, cause shifts like in your muscle tone and physical like uh, appearance and shape and everything beyond what the uh, material, you know, would expect to happen with like that you would need to work out or lift weights for something like that to happen. And I, I kind of see that because a <laughs> people that do just yoga eventually get to the point where they have strength, to do stuff that weightlifters can't do, <laughs> you know, like, so it's about the balance as much as it is the strength. But also I think about Eileen McCusick, who I learned to do sound healing from the biofield tuning guru. She is that she has all these before after pictures of herself where she looks like she's aged backwards. She looks like she's super fit now. And like, she's 10 years younger. And she said, it's, primarily just from using sound directly on her body with the uh, weighted tuning fork she invented. And she's like, it's better than going to the gym. So I haven't, you know, maybe I should be more dedicated with that, but I, I kind of just like the gym method, <laughs> but I want to talk about how these 
physical, chemical, energetic shifts you know, can be accessed and maybe what some of the potential is there beyond what materialism would allow one to believe is possible. Definitely. Um, and I will just as an aside say, I had a teacher, a yoga teacher in India who once lifted a car off of a child. Um, so, but he was very fit. Well, I mean, even like a totally out of shape mom can do that in the right circumstances. So yeah, there's, energy is a thing. There's something to that. I would say there are those beings who have awakened to a degree where they can manipulate physical reality without moving their bodies. You will have a far greater chance at succeeding at that um, where most people are today, myself included, um, you know, not to, which is when you actually put in the physical effort. So in, you brought up the sun and the moon in astro yoga, the solar and lunar principles, there's a couple layers to them, right? There's many layers. There's the sun and the moon you see in the sky. Those actually provide us with light and like the raw force of light, right? Sunlight creates photosynthesis. We wind up eating um, either animals that ate the photosynthesized plants or the plants themselves, right? The moon helps the water movement of the plants. So these things are things we actually eat, consume, experience. But on a much more rudimentary level, they are also the manifest forms you see around you. So when you move your physical body, um, you're actually using solar and lunar principles. And they're not, because the moon is considered to be reflective of the sun, they are distinct from one another, but they are not separate from one another, right? In the way that when we see a wave, we can differentiate the wave from the other waves, but they're both pieces of the ocean. And so if you want, well, I guess I should explain what happens with the sun and the moon. So with the solar and lunar principles, the moon or the lunar principle builds manifest reality, right? This is the principle um, of telepathy, right? The thing that connects us with other beings. This is the principle of the intelligence of the body that actually will build your body a particular way that will digest your food for you, that will um, create a child, right? In the event that someone is impregnated, all of these things, right? Will keep you healthy basically. And it's very smart. We often refer to it as the subconscious principle. And this sometimes makes people think like, oh, this is a lower form than my self-conscious principle. In fact, not the subconscious principle is just the principle that we have access to um, that we may or may not be able to become conscious of, right? The super conscious principle is a higher principle and it's sort of in this pure state. Now the subconscious principle takes information both from super conscious reality and from self-conscious suggestion and it creates your life. And so basically like when you're getting what you wished for, that's the lunar principle at play. So side note in yoga, that's why one of the keys, if you, if you study the hidden meanings in, um, for example, Patanjali's yoga sutras, you'll find that one of the first steps of yoga is Ishvara Pranidhana. And it's one of the most potent things you do. And the Ishvara Pranidhana is the surrender. It's usually translated surrender to God, um, surrender to higher self, surrender to whatever the highest is, right? So you do that, right? Because you want the super conscious principle to take over, right? A lot of what we're doing in yoga is trying to become self-realized solar stars, right? So that the movements of the lower reality don't come to affect us so much. So, so you, what you're trying to do though, when you're doing this is ground the light more in your lived reality so that your good days aren't few and far between. They're actually every day because you're able to create that. And then the lunar principle is responsive to you um, building the body you want to have, um, which includes making those physiological changes that shift your blood brain chemistry towards greater states of enlightenment. Um, and that is also includes other things like getting what you really wanted 
getting the car you want. I don't know, whatever people want in life, meeting your dream lover, you know, all those things. Right. And then like the quality of how that turns up is going to be dependent on the clarity in which you are able to want it or like know why it is what you want and all that. I think a lot of people, because <laughs> what they really, what people really want deep down, I think that is sometimes obscured by their trauma is that they want wholeness. They want closure. They want to integrate whatever it is that they feel separated because of. And so in the case of people who maybe have gone through a lot of trauma, they've gone through some serious roller coasters and self-destructive habits, and they've come out the other side where like now they really want to do better and they're trying, but they keep running into the only people I meet are damaged goods like me. And as soon as we bond, everything goes everything goes right back to trauma town. You know, I think that's because that maybe you can expand on this, but you actually are getting what you wish for in that case, which is the mirror to hold up what it is that needs integrating for you to achieve wholeness. So the lunar principle contains memory as well, not just the personal memory, but the access to the Akashic record. Right. And so when you're, when you're working with the lunar principle, you do have to recognize the tendency of the lunar principle to elaborate and create what has already been set in motion. And sometimes negative things show up and, you know, from the highest, like from the regular perspective, like, yes, it's tragic and we need to have compassion for people and we need to treat actual tangible events as the, as the issues they are when they arise. On another level, you can look at those things perhaps and begin to be like, okay, this is bad, right? I don't like this thing. How can I not get in this situation in the future? How can I find my strength to battle it? How can I find the way that I can rise up and meet this? And that's the first step in getting the lunar principle lined up. Um, this happens all the time in yoga. We call them samskaras, right? These, these seeds which are the latent impressions of the human being. And we have positive and negative samskaras. And they say, as you do practice, the samskaras that are the negative, sort of not of the highest samskaras burn and that the burnt seed won't sprout. And so you see people start to do yoga. Year one, they love it. It's happy. They feel great. Year two, they hate it all of that smoke is burning out of their bodies and moving out. And, you know, that's when, if I were to encourage someone to do astrology readings, that's when I would say, go to your astrology chart. You can figure out the exact energetic makeup that you need to embody to be able to move this out of your form. And you can figure out the highest alignment with yourself that will allow you to step into this space, as well as like, for example, people who get in some repeating pattern of relationships or people who get in um, some negative work situation all the time, you can see what you actually need to be present for or with in order for those areas of your life to begin to go well, for you to change things around for yourself. And you can do specific practice for that. And that's what I think everyone will learn how to do in the Aquarian age for themselves. That's really why I wrote the book because I was like, people need to know that they can just do this. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> I know the feeling like uh, I, got, I got to do something. They're, they're having a hard time out there. <laughs> well, and you know, we've all had hard times and you're, you know, when you're in the hard time, you're like, you're like, how do I get out of this? Like, what is the answer? Or if it's a pattern, that's even worse. You're like, why is this happening again? Right. And so then you can go look and say, oh, okay. If I get really honest with the astrology chart, you see the patterns happening in this particular way. And it's actually actually quite easy to deal with once you get um, that differing perspective. Instead of being stuck in it, you have that astrology layer. 
So on the astrology layer, say somebody's been in the yoga for long enough that smoke is starting to come out their ears or nose or whatever. <laughs> and it's not, it's starting to feel uncomfortable. Would you be at that point looking at the nodes maybe for the direction that would help them, as you put it, embody what would be best for them to embody? I look at the entire chart as an, as almost as a personal yantra. So the personal sacred geometry of that human being. And I try to look for complete chart integration. Um, that sometimes happens over time. So, you know, someone comes for their initial reading. We look at the basics of an astrology chart. They start coming back more. We look at uh, their solar returns, their progressions, their transits, um, smaller asteroids. And we're looking at the way it's aligning energetically in their chakras and often we'll enter into a conversation about how that's come up before. And usually people have, you know, predictable from the chart places of tension, pitfalls. Um, and then from there, you can actually have that conversation to say, these are the practices and these are the, the like hobbies and things to do to, to get the person back into alignment. And sometimes, sometimes the lunar nodes play a heavy role. That's true. Um, and certainly you cannot ignore them or they will, that two headed dragon will come for you, <laughs> but yeah, I might, I might want to return to talking about the nodes a little bit, but you started, you kind of answered the question, but maybe you would elaborate on it more if I asked it directly. What is the sort of magic formula for, <laughs> you know, this is like, I know that this is, there's no answer to this, but I always wonder in, in terms of like letting go of things that need to be let go of, uh, what's the the mystery of where the grace comes from to actually let it go or to actually release the emotion or cry the cry or what, you know, like that. Do you have any other answer besides just pure divine intervention that allows somebody to go from like, okay, I'm suffering needlessly. I'm suffering needlessly to, okay, I'm going to stop suffering needlessly. Yeah. So if you are suffering needlessly, um, the reason people continue to suffer needlessly is a couple of reasons, right? They're one addicted to something that comes along with the suffering, right? So this happens a lot in unhealthy relationships. This, this happens a lot when you have um, an addiction to substance, right? You you want that that hit of dopamine, right? So sometimes that happens, and we stay in whatever unnecessary suffering situation. Um, when that happens, right, the person has to say to themselves, and this is easier said than done, right? You have to say, oh my gosh, I'm suffering. All suffering, I think, is largely needless once you realize that you are suffering, right? Until that point, maybe the suffering helps you figure out that you're suffering so you can find freedom. Um, but what I would do, first of all, I would not try to numb the pain. So if you are suffering, um, not, obviously, if you're acutely suffering because you broke your arm, sure, numb the pain. But if you are just sort of in a habitual state of suffering, I would, first of all, get rid of any things that inhibit the state of suffering. So, you know, I'm thinking just like drugs, alcohol, excessive television, anything where you're like distracting yourself from it. And then the next step is to really feel it, right? It's it's scary because often when you're in that state, what will happen to the physical body is a panic attack and it's unpleasant or a, a extreme sense of anxiety, discomfort, um, sometimes rage in certain individuals, right? And so you have to be willing to go to a quiet space and just breathe and feel that feeling in the body without mental attachment until it dissipates out of the body. And this is, you know, this is what we teach in yoga too. The key is just holding your space for it, not attaching to that, and then letting it run out. 
And then once you've done that several times, and it can take a long time. So if you've been extremely traumatized by something, and if that trauma has continued to manifest in further interactions, it can take a long time. But the pain never lasts for more than four minutes, right? So after four minutes, it will be gone. Now it might come back. And it often comes back at inconvenient times or just when you sit down to relax. But if you if you do that, it will eventually dissipate. And then the trick is just being like, OK, I feel a little better now, so I'm not going to do that again. Right. I'm not going to let a toxic work environment come in again. I'm not going to let I don't know someone take advantage of me financially, whatever it is, like whatever has happened to a person, um, you're, you're doing everything in your power now to be with it enough to avoid that situation in the future by moving towards something that feels better, right? So we're not running from the past. We're sort of being like, what's my vision? Okay, I'm going there. Yeah, I think that's a really good answer. The mystery of letting go of things is kind of like, like behaviors or feelings or whatever you want to let go of is almost paradoxical because of the question of like, how do I let go? You just let it happen. <laughs> and I think the avoidance of symptoms, the avoidance of dissonance and discomfort as prescribed by our wonderful, uh, you know, healthcare models, <laughs> avoid all symptoms, avoid all dissonance, even though the symptoms are the body actually run it like going through what it needs to go through to deal with the problem you know your body has all the intelligence it needs to it it's never doing something it shouldn't do it's always doing the very best option that it can with what it has to improve its own situation you know so yeah what you just described i think is the key you sort of just let it happen instead of going into whatever the avoidance pattern is to avoid the feeling or to avoid whatever the dissonance is, allow it and then keep allowing it. Even if it takes multiple times or a, a while, I think that's key. You sort of just let it happen. Yeah. There's a great book on that topic by, is it David Hawkins? He was an MD and a PhD and he did all of that research on the frequency of emotion. And he has a whole chapter in that book on the actual process of letting go. So if you're a person out there, anybody's listening and they're like, how do I let go? Um, there's a book and it's literally titled letting go. And it's, it will describe that process for you. So while we're in the first hour, I want to talk about the astro yoga more practically a bit, like maybe we could go over as you outline in the book, the three ways one can use astro yoga. Totally. So you can use astro yoga to, to align with the present moment. This would be like what I teach in my public classes. I don't know everybody's astrology chart who comes in to yoga. So I just teach according to what's going on right now with the understanding that will, that will be affecting people in various ways, right? And then the other way you can practice is by practicing for your own natal chart and your own life. So trying to align with yourself, um, trying to, you can almost use it. I don't like the word life, life hack, but now I'm going to use it. You can almost life hack your natal chart, right? Using yoga techniques to say, oh man, I really wanted, you know, this kind of energetic makeup. I really wanted my finances to go better or to feel more like myself or to be more engaged in my community, can I practice in such a way that aligns me to that energetic portion of myself, right? And then the third way is to combine the two. So you take an individual, you look at their transits, you might say, oh my gosh, you know, Pluto's on your ascendant. This might be a good time for you to do these sorts of practices that will integrate that transformative energy uh, which is likely to feel pretty intense. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it all sounds so sensible, but also when it comes down to like planning 
an astro yoga practice, what does that entail? Do you think a reader of your book who studied diligently would be able to do this without your help? Or do you think, you know, they'd be better off probably still consulting with you until they have the hang of, of sorting out their own practice and, and reading the stellar tea leaves, so to speak? You know, I think it depends. I think anybody could read the book and do rudimentary, at least, at least add in some practices. I have some example poses that would go with the various zodiac signs. Um, if you know how to do certain forms of chakra work, you know, those come into play. And so you could look and you could say, you know, maybe I don't read astrology perfectly, although you would be able to read it after reading the book, at least some, right? Um, you might say, you know, I'm really having a trouble with my Aries portion of my chart. Then you'd go and you'd say, okay, you know, what's going on with, like, what are some poses I could do for Aries? Okay, well, rabbit pose. Great. Well, why don't you do a rabbit pose once a day and see how that goes for you, right? So it could be very simple. Uh, more complex would be understanding and reading between the lines, which the book does share about, so you, you'll you have that information. So if you look at your chart and you say, oh my gosh, I have a T-square, that means energy can get stuck. Okay, well, what three planets are in the T-square? Okay, well, it's these three. Okay, what zodiac signs are they in? Well, now we have physical practice to go with the zodiac signs. And you might even go a step further and say something like, what chakras are these connected to? Well, then you have further information in how to add into the practice. And then you might even go a step further and say what elements are being are being brought up by this. And think about, in the book, we talk about the Koshik model, which people are less familiar with than the chakra model, but it's a layers of your being model. It has to do with your physical and energy body. And so you'd see, I think, from from the book, you might not, you know, if you haven't taken yoga teacher training and you don't know how to plan a perfect flow, I wouldn't worry about it. When I teach home practices, I usually give people six practices, like six poses, that's it. I say, go home, this thing for breath work, this thing for physical, and then you do it every day in your morning, 10 minutes, and then and then the cool thing is when people read the book, they'll be able to adjust it themselves because you'll see, right? Now, we're all kind of silly people, I think, and often don't attribute our lives going better to the thing that we tried to do to make our lives going better. Um, we talk about this in meditation a lot is how meditation makes your life better, but none of us will ever attribute the things that go well in life to meditation. Although oh, I feel great. I don't really need to meditate anymore. And then, you know, next thing you you're off the rails again, <laughs> whatever, you know, none of the glory <laughs> goes to meditation and yoga, but it really does work. And I think if someone got the book, they'd at least be able to work on integrating their sun, their moon, their rising sign. And then from there, I know, like there are some people who have taken my astro yoga course and they're a little confused on how to do practice afterwards. There's some people who have never studied astrology. They take the course with me and I would practically just hand them my business and say, you do it. <laughs> You're amazing. Like you did it so well from, from not knowing any. So it really kind of depends on the individual and their mind. But I think that, I think that, I think that you'll be able to do some form of practice. Yeah. It depends on the individual. If you're ready to also take some responsibility for figuring out the unknowns in the situation, I think then you'll, you'll do it like, and then other people may just find it interesting, but getting the concepts down ought to be enough to send someone in the direction they need to go. Right now, my question to add on to this is how, when you just talked about designing a perfect flow, uh, is it really very important for the order of different poses and uh, practices to be aligned in a certain way? Or could you just pick like 
knowing what you know about medical astrology or the zodiacal body, could you just pick some poses that fit into the things you want to work on and call it good? Or, you know, is there a, is there sort of a strategy to the flow side of it? So if you are teaching a public yoga class for lots of people, building people up properly is going to be really important to prevent injury and to keep people healthy, right? And safe. If you are yourself and you're planning a flow for yourself, you'll know if there's a pose that you can't do immediately, right? Some people can do the splits while standing on one leg with the other leg in the air immediately, right? Some people will never do that. Some people have to warm up to it, right? So you'll you'll be smart and you'll choose poses that you can do. And you'll sort of know, like if that's a pose you sometimes can do, but you have to warm up for it, you can you can put it toward the end. That's the rule of thumb. Now, if you're I'll never forget the time Gabriel Slick Dissident did the splits on a vibrant episode live. <laughs> That's hilarious. I love that. Split dissident. That's his name. <laughs> Split dissident. You know, and different different strokes for different folks. So you'll know. You'll you'll know though. Like if you're like the split sounds fun and engaging, and I'd love to do them right now. Fine, you can do the splits. Maybe that'll be interesting for your Sagittarius placements. I don't know. If you're like, that sounds like torture, is there another pose, please? Then do a warrior one, right? You'll, you'll, and for the zodiac signs that I put a more advanced posture, I also put a posture you could do without having to. So like, for example, for Aries, I think I put rabbit pose and headstand, if I remember correctly, because some people just, you don't want to do a headstand, your neck hurts or whatever. Um, if you do a headstand every day, though, and you want to integrate your Aries pieces, go right ahead. Awesome. Yeah, that this leads me to another question that is now flying out of my head. But <laughs> OK, so, OK, it, it came back. I, I, I let go <laughs> when you can't remember what you're about to say. Just be like, ah, oh, it doesn't matter. And it'll immediately come back. But if you're just like, I must remember. Good luck. Anyway, the chart of an individual will often have planetary pileups in one or two signs or a few signs. And then other parts of their chart will be devoid of any of the major movers and shakers, if you will. So do you find it to be more beneficial that people work on the areas where they are heavy in planetary activity or where they're light or non-existent placements uh, or... Is it more about where the planets are right now or is the, all of that conditional and relative <laughs> and it's more complex than that? Um, all of the above. I would say where there are planets is usually where you want to start and also where there are transiting planets. Unless the individual comes to you and they're like, you know what? I've never had a problem with this area of my life, but I'm really feeling whatever, behind my peer group, like I need to make a change, whatever people say, then you can help them integrate empty houses. Um, I'm like so tempted to just to explain to a too high degree of nuance. I'm like, unless if they're an intercepted house, but there's. <laughs> we like nuance. Well, sometimes people have houses that are intercepted between within a house. And so I would practice for those. Um, the, the book also explains how to practice with an understanding of both sidereal and tropical time at the same moment. Um, if that's too much, you can start with your preferred um, tropical or sidereal and go from there. But there's, I would start with where the planets are. And if you don't know which planet to start with, start with sun, moon get your light shining and then you can go for the trickier bits yeah that makes perfect sense and i think maybe in the second hour we'll talk more about that synthesis of the tropical and sidereal i know that there's more than just pk in the chat right now wondering about that very question 
<laughs> a lot of people are always, as soon as we're talking astrology, they're like, which one, which one? And I like how you sort of re rectify that question with a, a both this approach. I do like that. And we'll, we'll get to that. But since we're talking about the planets and preparing a astro yoga practice for oneself, which I hope that a creatively minded and already well-rounded educated person on astrology and, and maybe yoga or just someone with some fitness could creatively conceive of ways to experiment with these ideas on their own, which I think is the goal, right? We want, <laughs> it's not about getting everyone to come to you per se. It's about just getting these ideas out to the, uh, the people, I think. But how do planets inform the recommended postures? What I mean is like, you know, would there be a different prescription if Venus was in Aries for you versus if Mars was in Aries? Yes. Great question. And yes, that is the hope. Like there's information in the book, take it, riff on it, make it your own. Like the goal is that you don't need me. Um, I need me, but um, so that's important. The planets do come into play. So the sun and the moon, we already discussed how they are the super and subconscious principles. Occasionally the sun can manifest as our ego self too. So we have to, we have to make friends with the sun in our lives. And sometimes the moon can rep can show up as our emotional selves. And so we have to make friends with those pieces of the solar and lunar aspects. But there are other things like, for example, Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter is a planet that actually deals with study. So if you are like literally reading this astro yoga book, you're doing Jupiterian yoga practice, right? It has to do with jnana, right? This idea of the, the yoga of study. Um, there's, let's see, there's, um, there's mercurial practice, right? Which is going to have to do more with using breath work and pranayama. So if you're like, man, I want to integrate my Mercury because I need to use my mind to create and manifest reality. Okay. Or you need to use your mind to edit a paper. Um, then you can do pranayama, right? And so there are types of practice indicated. You can do physical practice for all of them. Um, you would, you would try to integrate through physical practice, the inner planets for the most part. So we're talking the sun, the moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. But I'm just thinking about my own chart, how Jupiter for me is in Gemini, but Mars is in there too. Does that explain why I like arms day way more than legs day? <laughs> I don't know. That's kind of a thing with a lot of people. It might just be a guy thing. We like the pump, yeah, pumping. But the question of Jupiter also involved, like, okay, so I really like that answer. Basically, you're saying that when we talk about astro yoga, it's bigger than just as asanas or poses. It is all the elements of what the planets, and we can talk about who are these planets, maybe a little more in hour two, but all the elements of what they represent are life. So in terms of Jupiter, guru, study, all of that being some, it, like for me in Gemini, it would maybe behoove me to, or be good for me, or particularly in, of interest to me to study Gemini things. And Gemini things are like truth, <laughs> uh, right? Uh, what, what All the things Gemini represents. So maybe that's why I've kind of always had like a scholarly, appreciation for trying to get to the the raw you know blunt truth about things i don't know well gemini rules the lungs and the nervous system right as well as the arms and shoulders so and i would argue that gemini represents a version of truth right sagittarius okay. represents represents the big truth that's the opposite of gemini though so when you're in the spectrum of gemini sag you're gonna have to you're going to have to grapple with truth. My Mars being in Gemini, is that why I beat up my lungs so bad when I was younger? <laughs> it could be Mars rules fire. So I don't know if you did that by smoking, but <laughs> could have been, could have been. Um, 
Yes. So, but I would think that you're interested in truth and you're actually interested in truth. It seems like in a very Gemini way. So what you're actually doing for your work right now is you are talking to people and Gemini is associative with the truth, right? So you can talk to people with different perspectives and you're getting like different angles of the truth, right? It's like that metaphor where everybody is blindfolded and everybody's touching an elephant and one person's like, oh, it's like a rope because they have the tail. And one person's like, oh, it's like a pancake because they have the ear. And someone's like, no, it's just a wall, right? That's Gemini truth is we're each looking from different perspectives and we have the capacity to spiral up or down. And so you're obviously spiraling up and you're, you're bringing people with you. So that's pretty cool. It is. I, I mean, this is the best job I could have ever imagined, but, and that's just me. <laughs> so we're gonna, we're gonna migrate over to the members only second hour as we do here. And that's going to be continuing on Rockfin. The stream's already going there. I'll post the link in the chat. People can also catch hour two over on my Patreon later on tonight or early tomorrow when I get it posted. Uh, the first hour is flown by. I've got tons more things to ask you about in the second one but before we do and please take your time uh you don't have to rush it or anything but you know what would you like to leave the free listeners with tonight and maybe incentivize them to order your book one more time and where they can find it and all the ways they can connect with you uh that you most prefer totally so what i'd like to leave all the free listeners with is that you have the potential to take ownership and co-creative um, intention with your life and that you'll be able to do that using these systems um, or using the forms of understanding that exist in astro yoga and in these, these deeper looks. And so if you are curious about that, don't shy away from doing it. It's one of the most rewarding things you can do. And as they say, like, you'll, you'll walk your path and all these good things will happen. Um, also, yeah, I would love it if you read my book. They are available for ordering now. Um, the publisher is printing them. So I actually haven't even gotten my copy yet, but I'm told it's on the way. So if you order one, um, you will get it. Uh, you know, whenever they ship them and it's going to be awesome and you'll have lots of things to consider. You'll gain an energetic understanding of the Zodiac and it'll be really cool. If you are curious or you just want to work with me more, there are astrology readings that are available for you to book on my website. There are astro yoga sessions and I also have a membership um, the lower tier one starts at $27 a month and you get a ton of good stuff. The higher tier one's a little more than that, but you get a session every month with me. And those people are really a good time. They get together and we're like on Thursday, actually, in two days, we'll all be meeting to talk about how the full moon will be affecting everyone. And in this moment where Mars is squaring Venus and the full moon's forming a big T-square with Uranus, I'm sure there'll be lots to, to talk about. So thanks for having me on, Chance. Astrology is a great gig because there's never, you never run out of things to talk about. <laughs> it, just go, it goes on and on and on like time and eternity itself. Again, huge congratulations on the book. I hope a lot of our audience will order it. I think it will be well worth their time for newbies to astrology or newbies to yoga or newbies to both or people who are deeply entrenched in one the other or both it's going to be something that helps you elevate and integrate these very very intrinsically connected inseparable modalities from one another so really awesome appreciate you always fun to hang out looking forward to going deeper in the second hour we'll talk about that whole tropical and sidereal question i promise at least that and we'll see what else <laughs> and i'm gonna play a, a bit of a intermission song here as i do it is by wisdom traders my good friend david and then we will enjoy this track and take a three minute break and reconvene over on the second hour so thanks again emily it has been a blast 
Thank you, Chance. Thank you.